So our text is 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13. Um, it's actually Paul's use of what the genre, the literary genre of a, uh, a creed. It's kind of neat. Um, little story. You know you're in Bible school when you share a, room, a bathroom with four guys, or three guys, you're the fourth, and somebody who will remain unnamed, might be me, um, has a laminated version of the the uh, Nicene Creed, so you can read it in the shower. Um, I still don't memorize it because it's really hard, but I attempt to. <laughs> so churches, actually all churches, not just Catholics and Orthodox and, you know, the, the real fancy ones, all churches actually hold to binding creeds, Nicene Creed being one of them. In the PAOC, we just don't really acknowledge that, and we don't really say that too often, but if you talk about it, that is something that we do. But this creed is directly in Scripture. So, let's read it. It's part of um, Paul's trustworthy sayings in his uh, pastoral epistles. So, that would be First and Second Timothy and Titus. So, here is a trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless... He remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Dear God, I I ask that uh, my words just go through people, through people's ears, and your word remains. In Christ's name. So Paul is likely referencing something that both Timothy and Titus knew outside of their own works. So this could be a written document, something that Paul had said multiple times. We're not quite sure. But the way that this is set up and the way it appears in some early church documents probably means that he's referencing something else outside of the text. This is, I I just find that fascinating. I'm a sucker for early church stuff. So this phrase, the trustworthy saying phrase, appears five times. 1 Timothy 1, 15 to 17, uh, 3, 1, 4, 6 to 9, and 2 Timothy 2, 11 to 13, the verses we're looking at, and Titus 3, 8, uh, 4 to 8. Um, in order to kind of, like we're not familiar with creeds, so just to give you a kind of an example, I was, I was at work, um, I have not read the safety manual, so I was reading that at work, um, like you're supposed to. Um, And I'm trying to think of what I could, in the back of my brain, I'm trying to think of what I could have for an analogy just to help us kind of, what is a creed? How does a creed function? What does it do? Um, And I got to the part with uh, fire extinguishers. And you have pass, P-A-S-S, which is pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. So now I know how to use a fire extinguisher. Thank you. Um, And what it is, it's a way to succinctly put important information in a memorable way, and that's similar at least, comparable to how creeds function. They're a little bit bigger than a one-word acronym, though. So there's two main purposes for a creed. Um, it should be in the, in the next slide. We'll have them up. To succinctly package beliefs in a memorable and recitable way, and two, to articulate definitional, this would be like doctrinal or dogmatic beliefs shared by all Christians. Definitional in that way that it's triangle. You can't have a four-cornered triangle. That doesn't happen. So the first line in the creed. If we died with him, we will also live with him. At first glance, this passage appears to indicate that rejuvenated life that comes with choosing to die to self and live for Christ. That rejuvenated life that we all are living right now. And this idea is built on passages like John 10, 10, where Jesus says that... uh, Jesus says that he came that we may have life and life to the fullest. Or Paul in Galatians 2.20, when he says that the life he was living then, that's after believing uh, in Christ and crucifying his old self with, with Christ, he now lives in Christ. Or perhaps there's, there's more like elusive verses that come to mind. Jesus' words in Luke 17.22, whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. And that's not wrong par se, but I'm not sure if that's the idea that's directly being condensed into this creedal statement. Um, I don't want to bore you with Greek, so just two seconds. 
The Greek behind the phrase will live with, the Greek word there, is in the future active indicative, meaning it's roughly very simple. It's not here yet. We do not have it. Therefore, the type of life that is being spoken of is not the rejuvenated, spirit-aided life that the Christian believers, you and I, have right now, but instead is the often less emphasized in modern Christianity, the resurrection. Throughout the Gospels, not least of all John, the resurrection of the dead on the last day is a very persistent theme, and you see this in the early church all over. Jesus saying things like, the kindness to the marginalized will be repaired by those who show it, at the resurrection of the righteous, that would be Luke 14, 14, or in John 11, 24, 25. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. The guaranteed resurrection of those who believe in Christ, which is guaranteed by Christ's own death and resurrection, absolutely dominates throughout the New Testament. Doctrinally, this is articulated as the one who puts their faith in Jesus and follows him, they are justified by Christ, by him taking on their sin and giving him their, his righteousness. For people who are nerds, this is called imputation, but it's really just, think of an exchange. He takes our sinful place, and he gives us his righteousness. So in that framework, those who believe Christ takes their sin, he gives them his righteousness, and when Christ returns to judge the living and the dead, we will be physically resurrected and dwell with God in the new heaven and new earth. If we died with him, we will also live with him. Next line. If we endure, we will also reign with him. This line is probably, and I, th I think it's likely, the reason why Paul actually began to quote the creed to Timothy. The context of the pastoral epistles are endure, keep the faith, keep going. It, it's worth it. Just in the verse prior, uh, Paul recounts his own enduring, quote, for the sake of the elect, so that they may observe salvation. And that would be his enduring the hardships and the sufferings and all that in his ministry to bring the gospel to the Gentiles. This plays into the larger theme of the latter end of the New Testament. The concept of suffering with or on behalf of Christ is stated explicitly several times throughout the letter, both in 1 8, 2 3, 2, 9, and 3.12. And Paul applies this idea to himself in 4.7-8 to 8 when, he, when he has fought the good fight and kept the faith, and, and before him is awaiting a crown of righteousness. Then he later goes on to explain that such a crown is accessible to any. The reigning aspect of the verse, then, is also that, it, actually, it's in Greek, it's also that future tense, you have not obtained this, but it's coming. The meaning of this text is then relatively clear. Those who endure sufferings and persecution in Paul's present day, in our present day as well, will reign with Christ in the future kingdom. So, next line. If we disown him, he will also disown us. Out of all the conditional statements, this one's the hardest hitting. The concept of denying Christ comes naturally after a call to endure persecution, as it would be the cowardly way out. The phrase is mirrored by Christ's own words in Matthew 10, 33. Whoever denies me, I will also deny before the Father. Both lines in verse 12, that would be the one previous, the call to endure, and this one, ought to be held in tandem. Um, the only way to endure until we reign is not to deny, and failure to endure would be denying. So next line. If we are faithless... He remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Um, a quick note on disowning. Um, ES, or not ESV, NIV has disown. Every other translation has deny, and I will probably slip up multiple times from now on. <laughs> um, deny would probably be a, a, a more accurate one, but there you go. Our rejection of Jesus can terminate the relationship, but faltering moments of sin do not. Jesus' ministry and faithfulness is the foundation of the Christian faith, not the individual's Christian's actions or slip-ups. 
and it is his, his, that is Christ's, faithfulness to his promises that is the basis for our hope. One could read the phrase, for he cannot disown himself, in two ways. Um, the first is rather in a systematic way, where one thinks that because we have Christ in us, and taking verses where, you know, Christians are the, the, the temple of the Holy Spirit, and, you know, Christ, or other verses where it says Christ will come into them, make his home within them, um, that if Christ were to cut off them or deny them or disown them, he would be disowning himself. And that's not wrong. I'm just not sure if that's exactly what the verse is going with. Following the vast majority of scholarship, I would actually suppose that Paul is referencing and building on the Old Testament's theme of God's chesed. That would be Hebrew. And it has multiple, like, English equivalents. The main ones would be covenantal faithfulness, devotion, loving kindness, his ability and his character to fulfill the promises out of love. The word is used 240 times in the Old Testament, and it is the foundational and most important word in the Old Testament in regard to ethics and God's character. In the Old Testament, all grace and salvation comes through God fulfilling his promises and it's so too in also the New Testament. He remains faithful, that is, Christ remains faithful, despite Christians' moments of unfaithfulness because of his own promises and actions. Thus, he cannot disown, his own, he cannot disown himself, deny himself. He will not break his promises that he himself has made. And therefore, because our salvation is built on his faithfulness and not our own when we are faithless, he will remain faithful. So how is this practical? You can say, like, that's all nice high theology, or like, you know, it's, that's the Christian head knowledge, the theory, and that's nice to have and good, and everybody has that. But, like, how does this impact my day-to-day? How does this really affect me? Well, it's absolutely practical. After all, all theology ought to lead to doxology. That would be right praise. And all theology ought to lead to orthopraxy. That would be right action. Good theology does both of those. Perhaps the easiest way to see the practical applications of these theological statements is, are if they're said in a more confessional phraseology. So the verse, or the line, if we died with him, we will also live with him. In confessional phraseology, this would be stated as, we believe that those who die with Christ, their future resurrection is grounded in the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, I don't wish to poke at people or cause any tension, but Christian teaching and action based on the core belief of the physical resurrection is markedly low in the last 20 years. There's two reasons and probably a good third one as well. Um, why this, this could be. This could be that it's just people are uncertain about how this is practical and all that kind of stuff, and fair enough. The second is perhaps arguments around our eschatology and disagreements around that. That would be study of the end times. Wow, well, what's going to be happening when Christ returns? How does that look? Our arguments and discussions around that can completely distract us from giving this important doctrine the light and reflection that it actually deserves. And the third is it's really hard to sell degrade delayed gratification. Really hard to sell that. But the Bible's clear. In Christ, we have hope of a physical resurrection. Therefore, in the interest of merely presenting this specific text, I ask that we all lay aside our eschatological differences and merely agree that those who have died in Christ have a physical hope for our physical bodies. We aren't supposed to disparage the physical nature of our bodies because we will have them again when we are brought alive in Christ. We have a future hope. We, are supposed, we aren't supposed to play with spiritual escapism as if this is just some sort of testing ground and, you know, once we die, then we're going to leave and be with Jesus in some spiritual place separated forever and ever, as if God's cosmic plan for reality is nothing. No, we have a physical hope in Christ. If we endure we will also reign with him. Again, this line is likely the main reason why Paul wanted to reference this creed. And if we're honest with ourselves, the practicality of this one kind of just oozes from it, right? But just for consistency, let's understand it in the confessional verbiage. 
If we believe, or sorry, we believe that those who endure in this present world be, will be rewarded by reigning with Christ in the life to come. Alongside our physical hope, we have a relational hope with promise rewards. And this isn't like a promise rewards as in like, I serve Jesus so that he'll reward me, and that's great and dandy. Like, note who this letter's to. This letter's to Timothy. Timothy, who is either beaten, dragged behind a chariot till dismemberment, or stoned to death. Paul, at Paul's time, and in the time of the early church, the call to endure was endure economic oppression, threat of death, family rejection. The call to endure was generic. Endure. Even those things. Therefore, whatever struggle or challenge you and I are going through, we are called to endure, to continue to endure. After all, we will be rewarded with reigning with Christ. Paul comments elsewhere in 1 Corinthians 2.9, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And often remarks that both the present sufferings and the present blessings that are offered are not worth comparing the future glory that we will have with Christ. Jesus also states, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So endure to reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. We believe that if we reject Jesus, so too will Jesus reject us. Practically speaking, this can happen in multiple ways. And like in the modern day, it's outside of the church. This one's pretty easy in North America. People reject Christ for his, they don't want a moral authority. That one's pretty easy. We see that on our day to day. But this happens in the church too. This happens when we build up a more palatable version of Jesus rather than who he is today. This happens in the thickest books and the highest towers of academia. And it can happen also in the most private and smallest prayer closets. It's quite a stern warning. Get to know Jesus. Getting to know Jesus might be the first good step in not denying him. Continue to get to know Jesus. Before we move on, I just want to point out how the first three lines present a relational principle between the Christian and Christ. The resurrection is our future hope, and it's guaranteed if we died with Christ. If we continue to endure, we will receive a reward in, the, in that future hope by reigning with Christ. And if we leave or deny or reject him, well, then he too will also reject us. Therefore, the relational center point and the practicality of this theology is in the urgent call. Remain in Christ, stay dead to self, endure hardships, and your reward and place in God's plan and future is guaranteed. Why would you disown Christ? you got nothing to gain. Remain in Christ. Now, the reason why I kind of want to stop here is that I think the beautiful uniqueness of the Christian religion is about to shine through in the next line. So, have you guys ever been reading your Bible, and you're just going through it, and you'll go, okay, so Moses talks to God, Israelites whine and complain, X happens. David goes, fights this battle, praises God, X, Y, Z happens. Okay, going through the pages. Jesus heals this dude, talks to this guy. It's great, okay. Then he tells us, you should stop sinning. It's bad. Please don't do it anymore. This is really bad, and you, it's going to be end bad, too. You're like, okay, got it. Cool, 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 cool. And you're flipping through, and I think this happens, I don't know, I, I find in Bible school it's really easy to, to do this. But I think it happens to everybody. You're, doing, you're reading the Bible to read the Bible. And then all of a sudden, something comes out of left field and just whoosh, right out of there. And whether you read it, you hear it, or maybe it's just the Holy Spirit putting something in your head, but it comes flying out of left field, and it's something like, hey, Jesus loves you. You know that, right? God's got it in control. Or, hey, Jesus, God cares about them more than you, and he knows this more than you. That kind of shift is built right within the creed. The first three lines are conditional. They present the doctrinal argument to remain in Christ. You know, conditional. If, then. If you do this, then this. If you do this, then this. If you do this, then this. Okay. Cool. I know how to do things. <laughs> but if we're honest with ourselves, we're doing our best to remain in Christ, but we're not really great at it. 
yeah, we're staying in relationship with Christ, but I'm not always faithful. I still struggle with sin even in that relationship with him. What about that? I think if we read it too fast, we might gloss over the radically unconditional content of the last line, which is directly aimed at the previous question. So, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. An unconditional clause. An unconditional clause teaching that within the relationship of Christ, our unfaithfulness does not nullify the faithfulness of Christ. And our relationship with him, the resurrection, and the rewards with him are built on his faithfulness, not our own. As if they could be bought with obedience or lost through moral stumbling. Now, some of my fellow Christians, passionate for holiness, godly living, and sanctification, will go, yeah, I I know, but that's no license to sin. Absolutely, they're right. Both New Testament and Old Testament is very clear. You are called to repent, to turn away from sin, to cease sinning, and to chase after God. It is true. But we shouldn't read one part of Scripture to silence another. So, my answer to them would be, yes, and. Yes, that is not a license to sin. And this text teaches that our sins in our relationship with Christ, in our Christian walk, do not cause us to lose our hope, our blessing, and our relationship with Christ. Are you saved by Christ's perfect faithfulness or your own? No. Again, the confessional phraseology. We believe that Christ's faithfulness is the bedrock of our faith and not our own because He fulfills His promises. So this is an intensely practical, compact creed. By reflecting and memorizing these lines, we remember that we have a very real, physical, future hope that we are rewarded and will reign with Christ. Should we continue to put to death the old self, continue to endure, and never deny, and that all of that is built on Christ's loving kindness, faithfulness, and promises, and, not, and no misstep of our own will nullify that. Grace. And for the non-Christian, if you ever wondered what, like, Christians really believe that in that doctrinal sense, like, you know, what do they really think behind, you know, all the Jesus talk? It's still just Jesus. <laughs> it's just built on Jesus' love and desire to, lo- to save you and I. His death and resurrection offers future hope, relationship, and even rewards. Just don't deny him. Get to know him. And so... Like every good sixth grade Sunday school teacher, I'm going to end with that challenge. Memorize it, because that's how it's made to do. That's how a creed is supposed to function. You memorize those lines, and you know the depth of what they mean. So we're going to read through it, because I've been told that's how you memorize things. Um, We're going to read through it three times, and then I'm going to ask the band to come back up. So, from the top. You guys can help, too. (laughs) If we died with him, we will live with him. If we endure, we will reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot disown himself. You know what? I'm not going to make you guys do it three times. I'm going to leave that on you.